Origins of the Cthulhu Club from the CCRU Writings Captain Peter Visparov to Dr. Kidna Stilwell, March 19, 1949 Dear Dr. Stilwell, I have been fortunate enough to encounter your ethnographic work on the Ma, which I have studied with very great interest. May I trouble you with an account of my own, which might be of relevance to your researches. During the recent Pacific conflict, a peculiar oxymoron, I was deployed covertly into the Diboma area of eastern Sumatra. My mission, which was categorized under psychological operations, consisted basically of attempted cultural manipulation, with the aim of triggering a local insurgency against a Japanese occupation. I hope it will not distress you unduly if I confess that your work was a crucial resource in this undertaking, which involved intense, if patently exploitative, communication with Diboma witchcraft. My only excuse is that hard times require moral hardness, and even obvious cruelties. I was obeying orders, and accepted them as necessary. Beyond confirming your own conclusions, these activities brought me into proximity with phenomena for which I was cognitively ill-prepared. What began as merely opportunistic usage of Diboma lore, conceived initially as native superstition, transmuted incrementally into sorcerous war against the enemy garrison. In just two weeks, between March 15th and 29th, 1944, three consecutive Japanese commanders were incapacitated by severe mental breakdown. In each of these cases, the process of deterioration followed the same rapid course, from leadership dysfunction through violent assaults on subordinate personnel to berserk derangement and paranoid ravings, culminating in suicide. By the end of this period, the order of the occupying forces had entirely disintegrated. It would be dishonest of me to conceal the fact that the Dibanese paid a devastatingly heavy price for the success. On the basis of this experience, I cannot easily doubt that Diboma sorcerers are in some way able to telepathically communicate extreme conditions of psychotic dissociation. It is with great reluctance that I accept such a radical hypothesis but alternative explanations such as poisoning, disease, or a coincidence stretch credibility even further. Yours with sincere admiration, Captain Peter Visparov. P.S. I cannot help noticing that the dates concerned, as also of this letter, are strangely Lovecraftian. Dr. Echidna Stilwell to Captain Peter Visparov, March 23, 1949, abridged. Dear Captain Visparov, Thank you for your frank letter of March 19th. I found it truly horrifying, and yet also fascinating. I appreciate that it cannot have been easy to write. I shall not attempt to hide the great distress your account caused me, adding as it did such a terrible episode to the modern history of these cruelly afflicted people. While I was already suspecting that this ghastly war might have stricken the maw yet further, it is crushing indeed to have my darkest thoughts thus confirmed. I would be interested in learning more about the details of Dib Ma sorcerer's practice before attempting to respond to your hypothesis. Be assured that, after spending seven years amongst the Mune Ma, I will not hastily judge anything you communicate as wild or fanciful. As far as the question of dates is concerned, which you indicate only elliptically, I assume that you are referring to what, in the northern latitudes, constitutes the spring equinoctial period, mid to late March which is so emphatically stressed in Lovecraft's The Call of Cthulhu, and which also, coincidentally, comprises the intense zone of Ma time ritual. The complicity has long intrigued me. As I'm sure you are aware, Lovecraft had a peculiar obsession with the South Seas, a thematic coalescence of almost hypnotic ethnographic fascination with the most abysmal and primitive dread. I have attempted to correspond with him about these issues, but found that this topic quickly punctured his thin crust of supercilious New England rationalism, exposing an undercurrent of heavy fetishized archaic terror mixed with extreme racial paranoia. When he began referring to the rich and subtle culture of the Mu Ma as the repugnant cult of semi-human Dagonite savages, I broke off communication. Despite this unfortunate argument, I consider Mr. Lovecraft's fictions to be documents of the greatest importance and welcome the opportunity to discuss them further. In addition, my own Neo-Lemurian hypothesis intersects with his wider terrestrial and cosmic vision in a number of crucial aspects. 
particularly insofar as non-human cultural factors are seen to play a decisive role in large-scale historical developments. Captain Visparov to Dr. Echidna Stillwell, April 3rd, 1949. Extract. I am afraid you are right to suspect that I have reserved certain aspects of my engagement with the Boma sorcery, perhaps from fear of ridicule. What has so far been omitted from my sketch of telepathic psychosis, which I will now relate, is the source pathos, so to speak, or, in the words of the military officer I was then, the occult ammunition manufacturer. Not only did I learn of the Japanese command being wrecked by psychological cataclysm, both by conventional and decidedly non-conventional intelligence gathering operations, I was also witness to the assembly of the weapon itself. I had then, and still have, no doubt at all that the madness breaking out in the local Japanese headquarters was the very same thing that I saw brewing up like a dust vortex in the adubite trances of a Dibonese witch, whom I came to see as my greatest tactical asset and most valued companion, in that order, I confess. It was an experience of soul-carving horror for me to witness this meticulously deliberated descent into the splintering of self, complete personality disintegration, which she somehow traversed, and what she called shattering the mirror of existence. I gathered that this expression originally referred to the surface of still water, but since the arrival of European colonists' silver mirrors had been highly treasured, and their pulverization invested with immense ceremonial significance. Dibami sorcery does not seem to be at all interested in judgments as to truth or falsity. It appears rather to estimate, in each case, the potential to make real, saying typically, perhaps it can become so. Echidna Stillwell to Peter Visparov, April 19, 1949. Extract. While I was respecting the candor of your account, I cannot but abominate the necessity that has led the Ma and their sorcerer's abilities to be conceived and utilized as mere munitions in a conflict imposed upon them from without. From what I can reconstruct from your description, it seems to mark a degeneration of Ma demonism and time sorcery into mere magic, or the imposition of change in accordance with will. In this case, the will in question being the overall policy and strategic goals of the U.S. war effort, microcosmically represented by your own, evidently gallant, competent, and persuasive military office. Forgive my lack of patriotic ajour, but it strikes me as an appalling indication of cultural decay and corrosive nihilism when a dib ma witch allows herself to be employed as a crude assassin. However one evaluates the causes thus served. This is all a matter of deepest regret, although not, to my way of thinking, of individual culpability. As the Mu Ma say in their bleakest moments, time is in love with her own pain. Your discussion of a dub trance makes no mention of temporal anomaly. This surprises me. The Mu had an immense respect for those Dibba witches who they described as returning from the adub time to come. And the Mu, Nagui, or dream witches, often claim to meet these back travelers in the vault of murmurs, where they would learn about future times. They said, however, that this time is compressing and soon ends, although I had not imagined the end to be so imminent. Remembering this omen returns me to abysmal melancholy, consoled only by another Mu and Ma saying, The myriad does not pass as time passes. I shall try to think things thus, as you say, with the Dibamese, Perhaps it can become so. Peter Visparov to Echidna Stillwell, May 7, 1949. Extract. Dear Dr. Stillwell, here in Massachusetts, we have been convening a small Lovecraft reading group dedicated to exploring the intersection between the Mu cultural constellation, Cthuloid contagion, and twisted time systems. We are interested in fiction only insofar as it is simultaneously hyperstition a term we have coined for a semiotic productions that make themselves real. Cryptic communications between the old ones signaling returns. Schleth Hud Depesh. This is the ambivalence, or loop, of Cthulhu fiction. Who writes and who is written? It seems to us that the fabled Necronomicon, sorcerer's countertext to the Book of Life, is of this kind, and furthermore, that your recovery of the Lemira Digital Pandemonium Matrix accesses it as its hyper source. I hope it is superfluous to add that any directly participative involvement on your part would be most extravagantly appreciated. 
Akin to Stillwell to Peter Visparov, May 28th, 1949. Extract. It is with some trepidation that I congratulate you on the inauguration of your Cthulhu Club, if I may call it as such. Whilst not in any way accusing you of frivolity, I feel bound to state the obvious warning. Cthulhu is not to be approached lightly. My researches have led me to associate this Cthonian entity with the deep terrestrial intelligence inherent in the electromagnetic cauldron of the inner Earth and all of its intense reality, raw potentiality, and danger. According to the Ma, she is a plane of unlife, a veritable Cathel, who is trapped under the sea only according to a certain limited perspective, and those who set out to traffic with her do so with the very greatest respect and caution. That her submerged Pacific city of Relay is linked to a Lemiro movie and culture strain seems most probable. But the assumption that she was ever a surface dweller in a sense we would straightforwardly understand can only be an absurd misconstrual. It is much more likely that Cthulhu's rising, like that of Kundalini, as it was once understood, is a drawing down and under, a restoration of contact with abysmal intensities. Why would Cthulhu ever surface? She does not need rescuing, for she has her own line of escape, trajected through profundity. Much of this relates to the occult teachings of the sub-chakras and zones of Indo-Lemurian influence. Hyperstition strikes me as a most intriguing coinage. We thought we were making it up, but all the time the Ma were telling us what to write, and through them.